Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's devotional. Our thought today is going to come from Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, we're going to look at verse 10, what Jesus' response is. But, <clears throat> excuse me, first, notice that this is not a Jew. This is not someone who necessarily would have been raised hearing about the prophecies and Old Testament law, Mosaical law, and the history of, of the Jews. This is a centurion, a Roman centurion, who certainly would not necessarily be beloved by the Jewish people. Yet he comes to Jesus and <clears throat> he's pleading with Jesus that a servant, who apparently the centurion is very partial to this servant, he says he's lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. We have a couple other adjectives and details from some, uh, from, uh, some of the other uh, accounts of this event. But you have this servant who is apparently in very bad ways. He's, he's paralyzed and he's apparently in pain. Now, how did the centurion hear about Jesus? Well, we don't know. We don't know how the centurion heard about him. We know that Jesus earlier, this is after the, the Sermon on the Mount that we refer to, Matthew's cha Matthew's, Matthew chapter 5 on through 7, uh, is the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> and we see him coming down from the mountain. We see a leper coming to him and worshiping him. Jesus cleanses him. And then Jesus goes from the Sermon on the Mount into Capernaum. The centurion surely have, has heard things about Jesus, maybe even some things. That, now, remember, Matthew chapter 4 was when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and it was after that event that Jesus really actively, what we would say, actively started his ministry. So it's not like Jesus has been around already for three years or something, teaching and preaching and performing miracles. But... However, the centurion has heard about him, whatever word has come to Capernaum already about Jesus, this centurion comes to him and notice Jesus offers and says, I'll come and heal him, which is the implication of verse six, even though the centurion doesn't actually ask Jesus, will you please heal my servant per se? It's more, it's like the centurion knows that Jesus has the ability to do this. Presumably, the centurion has heard of the miracles Jesus has performed already. So in verse 7, Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. Okay, and, and that would seem to be an answer to exactly what the centurion wants. But notice what the centurion responds. And there's nothing here that suggests from Jesus that the centurion is being fake humble or that he's just uh, putting on a show or, or paying lip service or anything like that. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Now, I don't, again, I don't know what the centurion's history is, but it is incredibly interesting that not only does the centurion know that Jesus has the ability to heal, which is why he's come begging Jesus to start with, but he acknowledges here in verse 8 the glory, the uh, majesty of the Lord. He says, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. There is a sense in which the exaltation of the Lord in this centurion's mind is such that I'm not worthy you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now he goes in from verse eight into verse nine, to kind of explain himself. He says, I am a man under authority. As a centurion, he was over a hundred men, and he understood the idea of being in charge and having authority. He says, I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, he comes. To my servant, do this, he does it. Now, there's no more dialogue given to us between this centurion and Jesus after verse 9 regarding what the centurion says. At verse 10, Jesus responds. 
But what's fascinating to me is the fact that, first of all, he understands the power of Jesus. He understands how exalted and uh, glory, uh, the, the majesty and glory of the Lord. And he understands the Lord's authority. Because when Jesus responds here in verse 10, when Jesus heard, when he heard what this man said, he marveled. And to those who followed, remember, this is right after the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is he who? And Jesus talks about the pure of heart and, and those who suffer for the kingdom's sake. And he goes through and describes all of these different, and of course, there's far more to the, the, uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount than just the Beatitudes. But he marveled, and to those who had followed him, apparently all the way to Capernaum, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now I want to focus on Jesus' response. He says, he, he, says he's, he marveled. And there's only literally one handful. I mean, there's not even five times in the New Testament where we find in the Gospels that Jesus marveled at somebody's faith. And that's not to say that there weren't faithful people in Israel, for that matter, or much less people in, in other places like the centurion who had faith. But remember what we talked about yesterday. Faith is conviction. It is persuasion. And sometimes the concept of conviction and persuasion can be in degrees. It can, it can kind of, there's a spectrum there. Just how much faith do you have? For instance, the, the, the parable of the sower, we have example of the, the seed that was sown in the, the stony places. Okay. Individuals who received the word were expressly told that they received the word and for a while were faithful. So their faith had led them to obey the gospel. But then, because they didn't have any root, they didn't have any foundation, when trial and tribulation came, they fell over. They didn't have any root and so they fell away. So their faith was suitable up to a point. Their faith was strong up to a point until life became difficult because of their faith, at which point they turned away. Well, here in verse 10, we have Jesus marveling at the faith of the centurion because it is such that this man with complete and utter conviction says, only speak a word, my servant will be healed. I can say to, what, who, to, to those who serve me, you go and do this and they'll do it. And the implication here is all of nature serves the Lord. The centurion believes that. He is absolutely convicted that all Jesus need do is say the word. And nature itself, the power itself of God, will do what Jesus says. And this is why Jesus marvels. It's not just that this man believes truly, it would seem that Jesus really is the son of God. But it is the, the level of understanding this man has that because of the complete authority of Jesus, he can command anything to be done, and it would be done by the power of God. And that's why Jesus marvels at the faith of this centurion. He says, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Again, it's not that there weren't faithful people in Israel. There were. I mean, the apostles certainly at least 11 of the 12, were very faithful men. And there are other examples where Jesus marvels at people's faith. We think about the, the woman who had the issue of blood, who was convinced that all she had to do was, was touch the hem of his garment and she would be healed. So there are other places and other times where people show forth this great faith. This is just an expression from Jesus to show just how amazing this is that a centurion who is a Gentile, and that's really what this, this statement is, that this is a man who is a Gentile, who wasn't raised with the Old Testament, who wasn't raised with the prophecies, who wasn't, hadn't, didn't grow up with this great expectation of the Messiah, should have such great faith that it made Israel pale in comparison. 
verse 11, Jesus describes that very dynamic between the Jew and the Gentile. I say to you that many will come from east and west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's describing Gentiles. That's exactly what he's describing here in verse 11. People who are not of what would have been the natural kingdom of God, those who had been given the oracles of God within the, the lineage of the Jews, they grew up hearing the prophecies and should have known how to identify the Lord. He says, I say to you, many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's a phrase that was used throughout the Old Testament. God was constantly calling himself, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob represent the fathers of the Jews. The, the, this is the origin of the Jewish people. And to say that the Gentiles will come and they will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, uh, that's, that's as, as uh, controversial and as uh, offensive a statement that a Jew could probably have heard. Then in verse 12, Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, but the sons of the kingdom, who are we talking about? We're talking about those who are of the fleshly Jewish lineage, will be cast out into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's describing judgment, condemnation judgment. And it's not to say that all of Israel, that how it happened to all of Israel or, or all of the Jews, but he is describing how that the vast majority of, and even as we see Jesus being rejected by his own people, as was prophesied, that didn't mean all did. In fact, certainly we know that up to 500 brethren at once were still following Jesus as of before the, the institution of the, the church, the formation of the church in Acts 2. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus had appeared after he was raised from the dead to up to 500 brethren at once. In Acts chapter 1, we have 100 and some odd people in an upper room together, including the apostles. But... It's not going to be until Acts 2 and Acts 3 that we see thousands and thousands and thousands of people converting to serve the Lord. And that's after Peter declares to them in Acts 2, and there's 3,000 in Acts 2, who have to be told, you've killed the Messiah. You're the ones who are guilty of rejecting the Lord. Well, Jesus describes individuals who will continue to reject him, who will refuse to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, as contrasted by people like the centurion, this Gentile, who is willing to believe what they hear, what they see, and recognize that Jesus did indeed have the power of God. And he was who he said he was, which is what the power of God proved. He was the son of God. And so then in verse 13, as we noted, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. His servant was healed that same hour. You know, I wonder sometimes who this centurion was, you know, what other details about the centurion and we don't we don't really know anything else about him but there are other examples of gentiles who are taught or who at least hear about jesus and are willing to do those things that are right and do those things that god wants them to do we have example of cornelius who hadn't heard about jesus but he had heard enough at least from presumably the jews in in where he was to understand that he had to serve Jehovah, and he did so. He sought to serve Jehovah, thus Peter was sent to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 to tell him what he must do to be saved. Well, we have examples of people like this who we don't know their background, we don't know what ended up happening to them, but I certainly would you know, like to think that this centurion, as the gospel progressed, as this centurion certainly had his faith uh, proven by his great trust in the Lord, uh, verified and justified when his servant was healed, that the centurion kept track of the Lord. Maybe he even went and heard him some more. Maybe he was present at other miracles. And I'd like to think that eventually, when the, the church was established and the apostles were preaching and teaching the gospel, I like to believe the centurion was baptized and became a Christian. I don't know. Cornelius was. And certainly there were other Romans and certainly there were other Gentiles who were in the region of Judea, not, not much less as the gospel spread further. But it, it's the things that some, some of these things that we don't know that I would, I would love to know. And one day maybe 
we can ask the Lord himself, just what was the history with this centurion? How did he hear about you? And, you know, what ended up happening to him? But I, I think it's a great example of faith from a man, again, that, that shows us that this is someone where their conviction was absolute. And, and to make it applicable for us is the question, how absolute is my conviction? Now, granted, you know, the Lord isn't here on earth anymore to uh, be able to, to miraculously heal people. The apostles are no longer on earth to miraculously heal people. And it's not to say that uh, the Lord you know, can't still provide uh, means of healing through his providence and through his power. I don't believe you'll ever see a miracle as defined by the New Testament, which is an observable suspension of natural law. I don't think you'll just see a tumor all of a sudden disappear. But what we do find is how, or the question that we ask is how convicted are we? Do we have the same level of conviction as the centurion? You know, when we pray to God, James tells us that when we pray to God, we're not to doubt. James even describes uh, the, the, the righteous, or the, the, Effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In James chapter 1, when we ask of God, we should not do so with any doubting. Now, that's not to say we don't acknowledge that God can say yes, he could say no, or he could say yes, but you're going to have to wait, you know, later, but not right now. But still having the conviction of knowing God is fully capable. The Lord is fully, was fully capable of healing his servant the centurion servant. So what level of conviction do we have? You know, sometimes we use Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as a good example of this as well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they acknowledge to Nebuchadnezzar that the Lord, our God, Jehovah, is fully capable of delivering us from your hand. After Nebuchadnezzar had asked, who will deliver you from my hand? Well, Jehovah can, but even if he doesn't, even if he chooses not to, if it's not in his will to do so, that doesn't change anything. Because we're still not going to bow down and serve your idol. Well, and it makes you kind of think about our own lives and our own uh, prayers to God, thinking about God's providence. God's will needs to be what our focus is. And whatever God's will is, sometimes God allows things to happen. Sometimes God answers no to prayers and requests that we have, even though we may have the most uh, fundamental, uh, it's not for personal reasons or selfish ambition or anything else, yet it's still God's will that certain things are the way that they are. Does our, is our conviction such that we don't doubt God's power, nor that we don't doubt his authority? And do, would we have faith that Jesus would marvel and turn to those who follow and say, I've not found such great faith even in Israel. That's the devotional for you today. Lord willing, our next devotional will be on Thursday at 6.30. Hope to see you all then. Thank you, everybody.